GPT-5 released yesterday and OpenAI is claiming that it smashes every benchmark known to mankind. But if I know these LLM launches like I do, one thing is always true. A ton of hype out of the gate that isn't always backed by real world performance. So in this video, we're going to put GPT-5 to the test and see what is what. So let's hop in. So GPT-5's positioning was around a few things. Number one, that it was really great now at developing UIs. Number two, that it was really great now at smashing difficult to smash bugs. And number three, that there's a ton of developer productivity that's going into their engineering now to make the models shine better in real world situations. And specifically what they said was that we are reaching a world now where the benchmarks aren't as meaningful if you're getting a 98% score on all of the benchmarks. And what does the benchmark even really mean? And it becomes a little bit more about how we actually use these tools in our workflows to allow the model to shine the most. So those were the three things that they claimed were the major leaps forward with this model when it comes to coding. And so I thought for this video, we would test the most immediately apparent and visible aspect of that, which is, does it actually generate mind-blowingly better UIs? And so we have this fairly well-proven prompt that we use a lot in these videos on this channel for mocking up UIs specifically. And so the fairest thing that I thought we could do is just take this prompt, pass it into both GPT-5 and a Claude model, since I think Claude is the real reigning champion, at least before this model released, and see how they do with it. And so we're going to be pitting GPT-5 up against Sonnet 4. Now, this prompt is fairly straightforward. There's not like a ton of bloated context or anything in here. We're giving it a little bit of a persona prompt and a goal. We have this section where we can upload images and use those images as references. We give it some UX UI, like kind of aesthetic guidelines that we want it to follow. And then in these design exercises, I like to simulate device frames in the browser. So we're just telling it that that's basically what it is doing. And then we have this templated section where we can give a description of our app so that it knows what it is building. And then we basically say, hey, now go kick off and design this thing. And so this is the filled in version of this prompt. So I have a real app that I've been developing, and this is kind of like an elevator pitch for that app. And so I thought, let's just paste this thing into both of those tools and see how they do, again, without really much guidance. So we have our elevator pitch, fork cast turns restaurant photos into home cookable recipes using AI, helping food lovers recreate their favorite dining experiences. Pretty clear problem. A lot of people really enjoy eating and they would love to be able to cook that stuff at home, but they don't know how. And so this app is being developed to help them do that. And then we have a few target, kind of like target audience personas for this app. And so we basically took that and then we took a few of our features that we've already fleshed out for this app. So there's going to be like this photo capture and upload feature. There's going to be this menu description and taste input, like taste profile thing where they can say, was this salty? Was it sweet? Was it this? Was it that? Was there mommy? Was there not? All of that. And then we have this system where we'll actually go through and generate a recipe and give the user feedback about that stuff. And so we're passing in all of this to both of these models inside of Cursor. Now, the reason I use Cursor for both of these is I wanted it to be super fair. I didn't want to go use Claude Code with Sonnet in there and then go use Cursor with GPT-5. I wanted it to be Sonnet versus GPT-5 in both tools. So that's what we're going to do. So what I have here is a directory with four different fresh Next.js apps basically loaded into them. So each of these four directories that we see here is going to be its own little app. It's all contained. It has its own code base and everything. And so we're going to go into each of these and we're going to run two different tests. So the first one is going to be mobile design. So... We're going to just design these in the web browser, but we're going to be telling it that it's it's designing for mobile. So we'll go through and look at those. And then we'll do the same thing or a similar thing, at least trying to develop two different web apps and see what it can do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into each of these directories or repositories. So here we are. We have both these projects loaded up for the mobile screen, and we're going to paste in the same exact prompt into each of these. And we're going to let them go and we're going to talk about them. So immediately right out of the gate, what I'll say is the GPT-5 seemed to definitely take more time in this planning phase. It seemed to be thinking a lot more about it. Sonnet 4 is just kind of off to the races doing stuff. And this is the same thing for what it's worth that we saw in the demo from OpenAI, where it does spend a lot of time thinking. 
So let's see if it is using that time wisely. So what seems interesting about this just out of the gate is that GPT's chain of thought seems to be around the technical aspects of this exercise, like remembering to, you know, hide scroll bars and render this device frame and other things that I asked it to do in like the warnings and guidance section. Whereas Claude seems to be focused more on the fact that this is a aesthetic kind of exercise where it's talking about, hey, let me make sure I'm implementing the aesthetic guidelines, the bold simplicity, strategic white space, all that type of stuff. So that's interesting, but we will see if anything actually comes from that once both of these complete. All right, guys, so both of these finished. What's kind of mind blowing to me is this Sonnet 4 alone took up like a crazy amount of usage, which is kind of crazy to me. I don't understand how that happened so quickly. But let's look at our outputs. So this is what we got from Sonnet 4 specifically. And this is like kind of in line with the type of output that you're going to get from a tool like Sonnet when you give it like some guidelines, but you're not like overly prescriptive about like, hey, and I want it to look like these images and these colors and this typography. Like if you're not telling it exactly what to do, it gives you something that like feels feels neat and would be functional like in an app like this would work for an app but it doesn't necessarily feel like something that's you know some super professional like enterprise grade thing at least not to me it doesn't feel that way and so again this is like i asked for three different looks of the same type of screen based on what the app description was and so i mean we got something pretty nice it does like kind of cute little things in here new to put the chef hat and say intermediate and put some like reviews and things like that in there. So it's it's like an okay output. This is what we got from GPT-5. So a very different, right? Again, we use the same exact prompt. I will say this one from GPT-5 does feel a little bit more like professional to me. I, I think the colors are very boring. I will say that, but it at least feels a little bit more professional. And I think if we had like accent colors prompted in, this might pop a lot more. Now, what's really interesting about this is before I started to record this video, I actually ran this exercise through, but instead of giving it just one screen, I gave it like four screens to do at the same time. And the GPT-5 output was terrible. It was terrible. And so an interesting takeaway here is that it seems to perform well in this design exercise when you are very conscious of how you are providing context to it. If you provide too much context, it goes off the rails very quickly. So it's interesting to see that when I say, hey, give me three variations of one screen, it's like, okay, it actually gave me something that I think I, I would be able to work with. But if I had said, give me four variations of, or three variations of four screens or five screens, Sonnet maintains the level of quality through those screens, whereas GBT5 kind of shit itself and broke down. That being said, I do like how they did the designs here. So a lot of this like feels really nice the way they have these little tokens up here, the way they have these action items for like elevate it, scale it, swap ingredients, modify it to your diet. Uh, so I, I do really like what they, what they did here. I will say I, I like this better than the Sonnet output. The thing that I'm going to test really quickly though, is what happens if I tell it to adopt a specific design style. And so that is what I am going to do. And then we'll see how this looks when we get better like accent coloring and like a cohesive design style in there. So again, I'm going to provide this same prompt to both of these saying that I think their layouts kind of kind of bland and I want them to think a little bit more about the color theory and how they're integrating the colors specifically into those designs that they have. So like don't modify the UX of it. Like I, I want things in the same spot generally but I want you to try to make it pop a little bit more. So like kind of specific for a prompt if we're vibing, but also like a little bit vague. So I'm curious what they do with that level of freedom, because again, GPT-5 touts itself on performing very well with that freedom, saying that it has these design things now baked under the hood. So we will see how well that turns out to be the case. All right, guys. So they both ran through that exercise. Again, the Sonnet, I'm not like super, super thrilled with. I'm kind of wishing I had used Opus. I think it might've been better potentially in this use case, but not super pumped about what this looks like. But again, we're being kind of vague with our prompts and trying to see how these things can work without like super, super kind of like deterministic prompts that we give them. 
GPT-5, on the other hand, I think they did, again, like a better job at integrating those things. Like the accent coloring makes a little bit more sense. I, again, I don't love like some of the pink coloring and things, but I just said like, hey, be inspired by these two apps and go do something. And I think at the end of the day, did that pretty well with how it how it chose to style some of these things. So I would say on the whole, for this exercise, when you're providing very specific context, GPT-5 does perform better at least than Sonnet 4. Yeah. Okay, so I re that through Opus, uh, that same exact prompt that we gave the first two. And this is like the, so if this is Sonnet, this was this was what we got out of Opus. Um, definitely better than what we had out of Sonnet. I think like the actual UI cards make more sense. Um, but I still have that same feedback where I think this feels a little bit more like AI-y. I guess is the only way I could really put it out of the gate. Like it might technically the the UI or the UX like might make sense like in a systems sense of things like it, they're strung together in a way that technically is appropriate, but it just doesn't I don't know it doesn't feel as professional. I think the one that I liked the best out of these was this taste customizer option, and I like how they have like AI adjustments. I could say like, hey, I want this more spicy, less spicy. Um, this like cool little gradient thing, add some umami boost in there. So overall. I do think GPT-5 takes the takes the crown on this one, in my opinion. Again, just feels a little bit more, like, polished. I don't know. It feels like there's more utility in this screen, and it's not trying to be something that it wasn't intended to be. I think the Opus stuff leaned a little bit too hard into some of these AI features and made it all about that. Whereas this one, it's like, hey, no, that's like a helpful little addition that you can add on to things. But again... This isn't some super robust system where we have these agents that we've dialed in and we're utilizing those agents behind these things. It's just giving these models a little bit of direction and seeing what they do with them. And in that context, GPT-5, I think, is doing a better job on the design side, which wasn't the case the first time I tested this. So context, as always, is king with this stuff. Now, one last thing I wanted to do, I want to test it with an actual web app, right? So that was like a mobile app design screen, but like in a web app, right? Like it was inside of a Next.js app. And so I want to see how it does with a little bit of direction and then saying, hey, now go just go build me a screen that is like this. And I want to see what it can do for a web app. And so what I wanted to do is build me like a kind of like diff style screen inspired by GitHub that allows users to version control commonly used prompts okay so i have this other project i've been working on called prompt base where users can like store that stuff and have version controlling of prompts that they use and so i want to kind of create like a github style version control for that and so i am going to just paste this in where i'm saying that's what i want you to build this is the elevator pitch of the app this is the main problem statement and then these are the the target audience for it so let's see what it does with this and so we're going to do the same thing here. I pasted both of these into their own window. This one's going to be using GPT-5. This one is going to be using Claude Opus 4.1. And so again, we're going to just let these things ride. And the reason that I'm doing this test is because this is like kind of similar to what they did in the OpenAI demo. This is what the guy did on his stream. He basically said, hey, build me this finance dashboard thing for like a CFO. And so this is like, I think as close as as... I would get to that in terms of the things that I would use this for. It's like, hey, go build me this diff screen idea for this web app, okay? And so both of them are using Next.js in order to do this. So let's see how it goes. Now, as always, we'll need to see what the output is because that ultimately is the, the tail of the tape here. All right, guys, so these things are done and this is what we got. So this is the GPT-5 prompt output, okay? And so it has... I mean, a, a pretty basic like versioning timeline. So I could say, hey, this is the base of what I want to look at. And then I want, com I want to compare it against this one. And then we can see with some nice formatting, like, hey, what are the actual changes that took place between these two things? Whereas this one, you know, started off with input topic and then it was all blank. And now we have input topic, target audience, blah, blah, blah. And so built it up a little bit more. Nothing crazy though. And this is what I was getting at earlier with the GPT-5 thing. Sometimes it's like, it'll surprise you with what it makes. And then sometimes you get something like this and it's like, I don't know, maybe their usage was really high and they throttled me or put me on another model under the hood. I, I don't know, but it wasn't like a very involved ask. So again, based on the demo of what they had showed in their live stream, this doesn't seem to be super, super impressive. 
especially if we go and we look at what Opus did, okay, with the same exact prompt. There's a lot more going on here when it comes to, again, just like this exercise of like the styling of the thing. So we have this nice like version control timeline where we can toggle between different points in time and then look at the different versions and kind of compare them side by side like this. Or we can look at a split version. We could look at a, a unified version to see what was changed. Okay, kind of explains what was going on over here versus what was over here. I think overall for, again, for a very open-ended prompt, I think this one at least feels better. Maybe you feel different, but that's my experience. This seems like it's it's a little bit more polished feeling out of the box. So the ultimate question is going to become, which of these two tools should you use? Now, I will say I pay for the ChatGPT Pro 200 a month prescription and the Claude Anthropic 200 per month subscription. So which of those two tools, given the current environment, would I actually use? Now, the answer to that for me right now is going to be Claude because Claude code is a serious powerhouse. The models are one thing, how we build tooling into the models and like actually use them in practical real life situations, I think is the more important thing. Anyway, I'm going to keep experimenting with GPT-5 to see what we can actually push it to do. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you want to see all of that stuff in action. And if you want any of those prompts that I was referring to in the video, they will be made available for free down below in the description. So that is it. I will see you in the next video.